Tower response. Tower 35, fuel We have a 7.30 conference call with the battalion chief, all the company officers in that battalion, and then I have a, I have a morning meeting with my crew at 8 o'clock in the morning to review what we need to accomplish when, and what I've figured out from the training um, bureau or the station life, what we need to do. Um, and I review uh, my objectives for the day, again, what priorities, safety operational issues or uh, futuristic items that we'd like to accomplish today. So I have that at 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, hopefully by that time, guys are kind of eating breakfast or already have eaten or are getting that done so we can start our day out. And then based on whatever the objectives we outlined, either we're going to start tackling those or we uh, can always sprinkle in calls throughout the day. So as today happened, I think we got a call one time in between the morning meeting. So unfortunately, those morning meetings can be a two hour event because you catch a couple calls in between there. Tower response. Mega two story commercial structure, nothing showing, no basement. The offensive strategy and then command at 835. So this is uh, Fire Prevention Month, October's Fire Prevention Month, so we really make a, a heavy impact and uh, we really try to get out there into the schools this month. Uh, for us today, we kind of had the, the younger age of the spectrum, it was more of touring the fire truck and then seeing somebody put firefighter gear on, which was, I believe, helpful, just in case they did have an accident in the future and they were trapped in a fire, they would know that we are friendly people even though we're in our bunker gear and look a little different. So yeah, we did pre-plans today and on average I would say Station 35 gets about 12 to 15 pre-plans a quarter and they are very important and when you look at like the NIOSH, um, one of those line of duty desk factors is lack of pre-plans. So um, what we do is we, we head out into the streets and we have a pretty much it's a five to ten minute map of that facility and it outlines in, you know where you're going to get in, where you're going to get out, doors, fire suppression, fire suppression systems, where's a fire alarm panel, where's a fire department connection, and those kind of items that we're going to need on a fire. So we can get in route to that call. I pull up the pre-plan on the computer, 
and uh, the, the fire, firefighters in back of the truck can pull that up on the iPad and we can see what we're getting into. So it's, it's really a great thing and it helps us get ahead of the power curve. This is Station 35, its major, major intersections are uh, Rapahoe Road in Peoria. Um, here we house Tower 35, it's a 95 foot aerial. We also, we staff that with four personnel and then we also cross staff two airport fire trucks, Red 1 and Red 2, which is on the other side. And currently we have Battalion Chief 32 here. Station was built in 1983. Um, and actually back then it actually housed administration in one portion, the firefighters in another portion, and fleet maintenance, maintenance in another portion of that building. So um, as we traveled from downstairs to upstairs, there's 35 stairs. So if you forget something downstairs, it's a long ways to go down and get it and come back up. So this is Captain Hager's wall. Um, he was a captain at Station 35 and as seen on the wall here, um, he died on September 10th, 1989 in a roof collapse in an in-district um, fire they had. They were performing search and rescue, trying to find fire. And the fire, they had trouble locating. It was a weird um, construction to the building. And he, he died in 1989. So the crew here, um, they had a memorabilia wall. There was a box. And we really wanted to try to make it look a little bit better. So the guys here really invested a lot of time. And we had this custom-made sticker built here. and just did some different things to really try to memorialize uh, Captain Hager and remember him and his, his sacrifice he made to us. So that's the Captain Hager wall. Um, the other wall here, and kind of representing our community here at Station 35, we have the Denver Broncos training facility in our district. So with that portion here, the guys again, they put all the time in. We pretty much moved with the Broncos theme into here, as you'll see with the, the blue and orange. This is actually a signed um, jersey from Von Miller we got from the station, from them for Station 35, custom made. And then this is a picture here of Station 35 in the Super Bowl parade when the Broncos won. So the Avalanche, the Colorado Avalanche practice right behind our station. So we uh, decorated this, wall, this, what, this continuation of wall here in the Avalanche colors. And we've actually had a couple signed sticks, numerous pucks, and different memorabilia that uh, they have contributed to us to help represent the community here. Um, here, it's pretty much, we kind of went with the military theme. You know, we've got a patch wall, but we have a nice little patio to sit on. We have a grill, a Traeger, so we can cook our food and eat out here if needed. So take advantage of the, the planes coming in or taking off at night. It's pretty amazing and pretty awesome. This is an avalanche penalty box from behind us where the avalanche practice and it was donated to us. <laughs> so if you had to put somebody in the penalty box, you could do it here. Is that uh, part of the disciplinary action? <laughs> no, not, not part of the disciplinary action, only for fun. But we do have a penalty box at Station 35. We actually have 14 bedrooms um, and that goes back to the day of when there was numerous apparatus here. Um, we could house a lot of people. So we've got the main hallway, we've got another hallway down here, and another one down in the quad, they call it. A lot of guys prefer that room because it's quiet and dark. It's a light. It's battalion chief's office and bedroom. This is my office. All we have is curtains. So the curtain provides a little bit of separation, but no door. So there's no, a lot of privacy in the station, but at least you have a curtain in your room. So some of our busier times here, uh, we run calls all night long, and hence, Lionel Richie, all night long. <laughs> so it's an inside joke. We also have inside jokes. We have a ninja exit here. And the kids, every time kids here, they always, they always notice a sign. I kind of just ignore it now. But every time we have a station tour, the kids are like, where are the ninjas at? So they notice it. Um, this was administration upstairs, and it has since changed into a large workout facility that was created in 1992 here. So like, that is, we've actually got a super great workout area and we're super fortunate to have this workout facility here. So physical fitness for firefighters is uh, 
to me, it's the same as training. It's the same as whether we're doing a rope rescue training or hose training. Uh, physical fitness is training and we have to do it every day. Um, the importance of firefighters, especially when you look um, nationally and every, every year, there's a, a substantial amount of firefighters that die from heart attacks. So our big focus is to make sure we get in here every day and do some kind of working out to stay in physical fitness, stay in shape for ourselves hopefully make it to retirement, enjoy life with our families, but also for the citizens to be able to do the job because it's a very strenuous job. So an air alert one is a notification. They just call the station and say something may be happening. An air alert two is actually a response to the airport standby for some kind of issue. Somebody maybe is reporting a, uh, uh, maybe an oil light or some kind of small issue, but they do want to stand by. And an air alert three is actually a response. There's a guaranteed emergency and they need us to respond or there's a crash, a fire. So with station 35, what we'll do is out of our four personnel on the tower, two of us, um, the engineer and myself, will jump on red one, which is the, the big airport, aircraft rescue unit. And then the two firefighters will get on red two, which is the smaller airport rescue unit. Battalion chief. Red. Response. Air alert 2. In-flight emergency. Red 1. Red 2. Red 3. Red 42. Battalion chief 32. Air alert 2. Red 1. 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 In route, what we're looking for is, we, we talked to Port 5, which is our communications um, at Centennial Airport, and we're getting information. Um, what kind of aircraft is it? Where are they gonna land? What's the problem? How many souls are aboard? And how much fuel is on board? And so we can start looking at our response and saying, is this enough? Do we have enough ambulances, enough fire suppression unit uh, responding, or do we need to rethink our resources as, as far as what's coming? So as we get that notification and who's coming in route, um, and then I have a, a pamphlet I look at. What kind of plane is it? Are there any concerns? Uh, where's the fuel shut off? Or uh, any, any trying to get ahead of the game prior to getting there. So usually when we get to Centennial Airport, if I arrive first and the battalion chief's not there, I set up Centennial Command and we'll operate on uh, Alpha 15 radio channel. We have a designated staging areas for the airport and uh, the other airport station does too. So we stage at our designated areas if it's just a stage and wait. Otherwise, if it's actually a crash location, we'll get an escort from Port 5, which is their ground operation support for us. So when an aircraft declares an emergency for a variety of reasons, depressurization, they're having a faulty landing gear indication, they tell the tower that they are declaring an emergency at that point, and then the tower makes the decision to, to which level of an alert they would like to give out to us. And so for this, for example, they'll give an alert level two. And from there, they will call us on the radio and say, to my call sign for the, the duty manager that's on is port five. So at that time, that information is coming down to us. And then at the same time, it's going to South Metro's dispatch, METCOM, and they're giving that information to the appropriate uh, station that's gonna be responding. And from there, we are jumping in this truck here and we are heading out onto the airfield and gathering more information. Right. And now one of two things will usually happen, either that aircraft will land safely, and then they'll, the tower will ask them if they uh, need any additional services or any mer more emergency services, and they'll most likely, if they landed safely, they'll say no, and then they taxi to parking, we'll follow them to parking, get some more additional information from the pilot, or else there's the other scenario, which one we don't like, is if they actually have a crash when they get here. And if they do have a crash on airfield, what Port 5's job is to do is to coordinate all the emergency response that comes on the, on the airfield. So we're the, the conduit that everything runs through between South Metro and the air traffic control tower. 
So we basically, it's our job to make sure we get South Metro Fire out to the scene safely and across all the movement areas in conjunction with getting those clearances with the air traffic control tower. In terms of the best scenario for an alert three, that was probably the best one that we could have ever dreamt for and hoped for. And that's due to a few factors and the fact that the pilot had ample time to diagnose the problem. The problem was it was a faulty landing gear. He couldn't get his landing gear locked in place. He told the tower about the, the problem. The tower called me down on the radio, called me on the radio, told me about the problem. So we started immobilizing South Metro to come out to the airfield while he circled around the airport, trying as many different ways as possible to try and get that landing gear locked down. And eventually after about, I think about a half an hour or so, he exhausted all options. He was running out of fuel. But during that time of him diagnosing, we were able to, to know that we were gonna deal with a gear up landing aircraft. So we got all the appropriate response South Metro from Station 35 as well as Station 44 were already on scene, parked and ready to go, ready to rock. And as soon as he, before he touched down, I coordinated with the tower that as soon as he touches down, we're gonna show this runway closed and then I need a, a clearance for all emergency response to cross taxiway alpha. So they said, yep, that's approved. And that's a planning process. That's a, a communication between me and the tower. And then they give me that approval. And as soon as right before he touches down, I say show runway 35 right closed. They say it's closed, and then I get on the other handheld radio and I talk to South Metro and uh, tell them that all responding equipment is cleared across Taxway Alpha out to the aircraft. And at that point, I, why I say it was one of the best case scenarios, because this happened during the week where we had a, additional ops personnel on duty. Sometimes there's, there's only one person that's on duty that's to coordinate all of that, and it can be a little bit stressful and daunting because it's, it's excuse me, so much communication. That day, we were able to have ops personnel escort. Station 44, which is on the south end of the airfield, out to that aircraft, as well as myself at our Alpha 8 response point. So we had, by the time that aircraft touched down and skid into the dirt, we had uh, our units on scene with probably within about one minute. And the pilot did an exceptional job. As soon as he touched down, he shut off the engine. So we had no fuel, no fuel leaks, no fireball, no, no big fire. It was the best scenario you could ever imagine for an Alert 3 aircraft. What we're concerned about with um, aircraft and the differences in those fire trucks is, well, they carry a lot of water and they actually have uh, turrets on top. So one of the concerns on aircraft is different than the regular streets is we don't have fire hydrants on the runways or on the taxiways. So when we, these fire trucks will hold a lot of water. We have 2,500 gallons of water on Red 1. 1,500 on red three, and then we have 300 on red two. So we got a lot of water and a lot of AFFF foam. So we have water to cool the fire, foam to suppress the flammable vapors by fuel, and then we also have purple K, which is similar to a fire extinguisher to inhibit the chemical reaction of fire. So when we look at those, we use them synergistically to affect operations at the airport. So we're not required since we're not a part 139 airport to actually conduct um, fuselage training or mass casualty training but we like to do it anyway because it's great practice for when we do have the real thing. And so every about three years, we do a mass casualty accident where we do the worst case scenario possible for the airport. So for us, it's always a situation where it's involving two of our largest aircraft that have a mid-air collision that comes out here and it happens at night. So you're having to deal with nighttime conditions and it's always usually in the, the worst, the hardest part of the airfield to get to, to get crews out to. And we do that training and it usually involves, it involves our department, the operations department, South Metro Fire, with all their uh, ARF um, apparatus, uh, Rappo County Sheriff's Office, METCOM, along with the FAA. And uh, we do that training, and we also have a, a team of volunteers that come out, and we actually have, uh, we simulate as best as we can people on the ground that are either walking wounded or they're injured from, from the, the accident. And we love to do that training just because we love to be as most prepared as we can be at all times. And it's the best way to do it is to practice. Uh, Centennial Airport is extremely busy. Uh, we're the second busiest general aviation airport in the country. Uh, even though we don't have commercial scheduled flights, we have about 340,000 operations here annually. Uh, and that equals 930 takeoff and landings per day. It's about 23rd overall if you count all the commercial airports. That includes like O'Hare and SFO and, and, uh, and Atlanta, uh, we're 20 third overall of all the airports. Uh, so Centennial Airport was created primarily as a reliever to Stapleton Airport in the 
early to mid 1960s, uh, Stapleton Airport's traffic was increasing, and they needed a reliever airport to take off some of uh, take some of the business traffic and recreational traffic, uh, and relieve that from the Stapleton uh, Airport itself. Uh, George George Mackenzie Wallace, uh, he was the visionary for the Denver Tech Center, and he wanted a general aviation airport uh, to help support that uh, growing business uh, park. And now we have 21 uh, business parks around Centennial Airport. We produce about 1.3 billion dollars and economic impact uh, to the surrounding community. And so we're an integral part of the Southeast business, uh, business area. Uh, so Centennial Airport uh, sees a broad range of different types of aircraft. Uh, it ranges from military jets to business aircraft. Uh, we have five different flight schools out here at the airport, and we also have uh, a Department of Defense contractor that operates out of here, and we have a lot of medevac flights, and we actually have uh, two uh, Colorado Division of uh, Fire Prevention and Control aircraft out here, uh, multi-mission aircraft that uh, are based here. We're, yeah, we're in the, the preliminary stages of uh, designing a new admin building out here uh, that'll be both an admin building and a community building. So we kind of want to get back to where we have a central location for the airport community and the surrounding community to come and experience the airport. Uh, with the um, increased security out at, 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 at all airports across the country, including Centennial, it's a lot harder to get people out to experience aviation. And so we think that building will help bring the community out to the airport to, to appreciate that. And one of the guys was doing, uh, he was in charge of the, the ARF program, the Airport Rescue Firefighter program, and I'm like, hey, can I, I'd like to help you out. So he invited me along and we went to school and I was like, this is pretty cool. So uh, just in general interest in aviation and while I'm interested in it, I am actually more interested in the smart guys that I bring along the team. So we have some of the guys that have been pilots, de-icers, uh, mechanics, just really smart guys. So I, I like the station. Oh yeah, you definitely have a family here and guys to um, take care of you and you take care of them. And